Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, your mercy delights us and the world longs for your loving care. Hear the cries of everyone in need and turn our hearts to love our neighbors with the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, in the fruit of your soil. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors when you obeyed the Lord your God by observing his commandments and decrees that are written in this book of the law. Because you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it? No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. The word of the Lord. Our psalm is Psalm 25. We will read it responsibly. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Rather, let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. You lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly in your way.
The second reading is from Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before the word of the truth, the gospel, that has come to you just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world. So it has been been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, you have given the right answer, do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them, Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our creator, from our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. I'm going to read for you um, one of the verses of the hymn that we will be singing in a few minutes. The hymn is titled, When the Poor Ones. Here's one of the verses. When compassion gives the suffering consolation. When expecting brings to birth hope that was lost. 
When we choose love, not the hatred all around us, we see God here by our side walking our way. We see God here by our side walking our way. Amen? Amen. I want to work out with you a couple of definitions before I continue on with my sermon. The two words that I've been pondering this week are mercy and salvation. Mercy and salvation. Can we come up with a definition for the word mercy? Anybody have a shot? Oh, I see Angie up there, back in the back. Compassion. Yeah, excellent, great. Anyone want to add anything to that word, mercy? Definition for mercy. Yes. Sian. Can you say again? Laying low? Letting go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> My ears. Yeah, you can lay low, right. Letting go, okay, yeah. All right. Forgiveness, yeah. So um, what, I've, what I've teased out from sources is that mercy is something that in particular um, happens between folks where one is in a position where they could give a penalty or some kind of um, consequence for the other's action. And rather than, rather than just doling it out and saying, here's your consequence, they withhold that. And so forgiveness and compassion are, are part of that definition of, of being merciful. And so in our liturgy, we, we actually pray, God have mercy. We pray that in our liturgy. We sing that together every time we gather. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Mercy. Salvation. What about that? Anybody have an idea? What is, how do we, what is salvation? Tiny, did you say something? Rescued? Okay. You're on to it. Absolutely. Salvation. To be saved, to be healed. Okay. Yeah. So salvation can be thought of um, in several ways, I think, I believe. Salvation can be thought of as, okay, the penalty for my sins are covered with Jesus on the cross, and so when I die, I get to go to heaven. Uh, that can be, I guess, the classic definition of salvation. And so this, um, this lawyer came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to inherit what? Eternal life. And this leads to a story where it's the merciful, compassionate actions of one to another that Jesus brings out. You see, not so much about what happens after you die, but what happens while you're living. Salvation, to live out salvation to practice salvation in our neighbor, neighborhoods and the lives of those around us. So here's this lawyer. He's listening to Jesus teach, and from what happens in the text, it seems that he may be getting a bit agitated. He stands up, perhaps even interrupts the teacher, and he says, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So I don't know if it was a Q&A session or maybe he just wanted to cut to the chase and get to something more personally beneficial for him. The lawyer stands up, teacher, what must I do? Human beings, I get a sense, we, we would rather have a quest we would rather have something to do. And we have this concept that the harder the quest, the harder the job is, the greater the reward is going to be. 
So I'm getting a sense that this lawyer wanted to have something difficult, a really long to-do list for his own spiritual benefit. What must I do? You see? When I was an intern, well, so value versus quality, or or sacrifice versus reward. When I was an intern, we had preschool um, associated with our congregation. And there was a time where the preschool was not um, having very many, um, very many kids come into their program. They had priced their programming really quite low. And so the perception around the community is that it's a low quality preschool, right? You get what you pay for, all of that. Huh? We have this sense that the harder the struggle, the better the reward. He wants a quest. Tell me the secret, Jesus. Give me the key. Help me to figure out how to bypass those around me, the needs of the world, and give me something to do that will get me into heaven. Jesus doesn't answer directly. He says, look it up. (laughs) What do you read? What do you read in your law? Well, the answer is simply this. Love Love the Lord your God with these internal things, your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind, and then love the Lord your God with this one external thing, your neighbor as yourself. Your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Well, I think I've got all four of those internal things figured out. My heart, my soul, my strength, my mind. But I'm going to ask a very simple question, Lord. Who is my neighbor? What are my parameters? What are the boundaries? How far and wide does this rule get applied? Can I choose who my neighbor is going to be? Can it be someone who talks like me? Can it be someone who has a heritage that's the same as mine? Can it be someone who shares the same religion as I or the same country of origin? Do I get to choose? I've come to the understanding that God is less interested in how it goes between us and the neighbors we choose. God is more interested in how it goes between us and the neighbors we don't. Maybe it's too hard. Maybe tribalism wins out, where we just have to be with like-minded, like-skinned folks around us. Maybe we, can, maybe we just have to ditch the idea that diversity is something that enhances community and a sense of belonging. Maybe it's too hard. Is that true? No. It's not too hard. God is very interested in how it goes between us and the neighbors we don't choose. So who is my neighbor, asked the lawyer. Again, Jesus doesn't answer directly. He is so sneaky. He doesn't answer these questions directly. He puts his answer into practical terms. He tells a story as a way of of drawing the lawyer deeper into the ways of God. And there's this beloved story. The ones who are seen in the most negative light are the pastors among us, the priests and the Levites. Those who might, I don't know, have so much at stake to stop and help, I don't know why. In um, Jewish tradition, oftentimes the, the people groups of the Jewish community are listed this way. There are the priests and the Levites, and then there are the children of Israel. They're all children of Israel, but this is kind of a cadence of how how folks are listed. And so when Jesus tells this story, he starts with the priest as one who stops by. 
or decides not to, I should say, who walks by. And then the next people group are the Levites, who also walk by. And then as a listener to the story, you would assume that the third person is going to be a child of Israel. And Jesus takes that third, um, third marker of the Jewish community and instead places in the midst of the story those dastardly Samaritans. That people group that has had such a long-lasting um, friction between the Jewish people and, and themselves. So there's this Samaritan. What does Jesus reveal in this story? I've lifted out, I think, well, several things. First of all, personal spirituality can be damaging to those around us. If our personal spirituality is so important that we don't take the time to stop and meet a physical need, then we're actually causing damage to the world around us. The Levites and the priests, did they have a holiness ethic that they needed to follow? What was that all about? This story also reveals that we react negatively at first to difference. We react negatively at first. It also reveals that kindness comes from the strangest of places. Kindness comes from the strangest of places. Also, that trust and generosity are part of the ways that God preserves life. Think of all of the ways that the Samaritan gives for the well-being of this man. He interrupts his trip. He goes to him. He takes his own oil and wine and pours it on the wound, which is, you know, about as advanced as medicine could have been at that time. Bandages the wounds up. He lifts this man onto his own animal, and he walks and leads his animal and this broken-down busted up, half-dead stranger walks them both to the inn. And then he spends the first night with this broken down man. What would that conversation have been like that first night? Have you ever stopped to wonder how did that night go? And then the next morning, the Samaritan goes to the innkeeper and he pays him two days' worth of wages, and he says, okay, here's credit in the account, and please take care of this, man, and I will come back, and I will cover you for whatever else you need to spend. Where does that compassion come from, that giving of self, that sacrifice? It's tremendous. Um, in, his, in historical Christianity, um, this story is, of course, a beloved one that takes on a whole lot of analysis by commentators throughout history. One of the um, typical common ways to see this story is to say that the hurting and broken man are the hurting and broken in the world. The Samaritan, therefore, the one who stops, who pours out, who gives for the sake of healing, would be Jesus. And then the innkeeper, well, that's the church that continues on in between times. Remember how the Samaritan said, I'll come back and I'll cover whatever more you spend. So the hurting and broken man are the hurting and broken in the world. The Samaritan is Christ. The innkeeper is the church. There's another possibility. Do you want to hear it? Oh, okay, all right, here we go. <laughs> I was hoping you would say yes. <laughs> the innkeeper, let's just say the inn and the innkeeper is simply the world that we have. And let's say that the Samaritan is the church. Right? Those who see need around us, those who see the broken around us, whether they be friend or enemy, 
skin color, language, religion, that we actually place ourselves in a sacrificial way in between the broken down neighbor and whatever is worse to come. What if the hurting and broken one is Christ himself? When have we, when have we seen you destitute? When have we seen you naked or in prison or hungry? And Jesus says, surely I tell you, whenever you have done it to the least of these, you have done it to me. When I read in this gospel about the Samaritan taking the man, the broken down man, and placing him on his own animal, I immediately fast forwarded in this gospel story of ours to when Jesus sends his disciples to such and such a house and says, um, go and find a colt that has never been ridden and bring it to me. And when the colt is brought, the disciples place their cloaks on the animal and they place Jesus on the animal so that he can be processed into the city toward his own death. What if the broken down one is Christ himself? So what do we do with our good works? Do your good works... um, Are your good works a payment for salvation? Please say no. Are your good works a payment for salvation? No. Thank you for saying that. (laughs) I'm going to read a a few quotes from an author, a teacher in in our denomination named Craig Nesson. And he speaks about good works in the mind of Martin Luther. If Luther decried the attempt to justify ourselves before God on the basis of our good works and righteousness, he was just as insistent that good works and righteousness have their necessary place in relationship to the good of the neighbor. The neighbor in need, whether a family member, colleague at work, church member, or someone across the globe, is in need of our good works. The neighbor is in need of our good works. The gospel, in fact, frees us from self-preoccupation about our own salvation and eternal destiny so that we may devote our undivided attention to meeting our neighbor's genuine needs. Good works are those works of mercy and justice that our neighbors need to survive and thrive in their own lives. We perform such good works not to secure our relationship with God, but purely because this is what serves the neighbor's well-being. Under the theology of the cross, Christians seek not their own self-preservation, but life for others. This is a radically other-oriented and ethical understanding of good works that has nothing to do with works as a way of appeasing God. And then uh, another short quote, which I think is my favorite. The centrifugal force of the gospel propels us outward in Christian freedom to care for a world in need. The centrifugal force of the gospel. Don't you love it? The gospel is spinning us outward into the world, turning us once again outward into the world, spinning us from our self-interest to the well-being of those around us. I'm one who would like to continue to choose compassion and mercy when given a chance. Uh, If you are reading headlines today, you know that there are families who um, are probably keeping the lights off in their houses, hiding as much as they can. They understand that perhaps they've received a final deportation order from a judge, 
They don't know what they would go home to, back to, if they had to be deported. And they took a risk to break a law or a rule in order to try to find a new opportunity in a land that they had heard about from their other neighbors, from their relatives, this land. (laughs) And so they continued to um, be in fear, wondering what might happen next. Uh, This does not represent me, this policy. I would like to choose compassion, hear the deeper story of these families, look for a way to help them. Many of them are brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't know if you've seen photos of piles of rosaries that have been confiscated by people who have come across the border. Rosaries, what are those, weapons? My goodness. Yep, so we have this story of a good Samaritan in our midst, along with our current headlines, and struggling with our prayers and what to do. But even though we don't have a simple solution, we have this centrifugal force of the gospel. (laughs) And as a participant in the work of the gospel, God is continuing to turn you outward toward those around you to look for a way to be a sign of hope and life. And then, I think, also to be surprised by the hope and life that comes back to you because you've simply paused long enough to know, to look, to listen, to love, to be vulnerable. Amen.